encourage you to take a Bible and turn to Proverbs, the 22nd chapter. And verse 6 is an important verse in the Proverbs. And I just want to, we stopped there uh, last week of looking at that particular verse and how it's used in our, our day and time. I've, I've, said, I've heard preachers talk about you need to train your child in the way he's bent. Uh, personalities and all of those things and that may be helpful but this passage is talk, talking about the different ways that you can train your child but the way that he should go uh, that there's going to be why training if you're going to be just kind of going the way he's bent to go so you're going to have to come in with God's instructions but it's the way and it's not a passage this is the Proverbs it talks about a general truth could you tell me what principle was being highlighted in a positive way in this passage? We don't want to, you know, we'll use it as, well, if you didn't, if they go astray, then you didn't train them right. It's a negative. But what's the positive message of that passage? Is it showing the importance of training? Training is very important, isn't it? Because what does training do? It stays with you. And that's what, if you're never trained in the way that you go, you'll never know that's the way you should go. But there's the discipline that's involved in training. It is, it did say just teach, but train them in the way that they should go. And even when he is old, even when he's old, that's a key. Even when he's old, it's not tomorrow, next day, but even when he's old, he will not depart from it because he's been trained that way. That's the positive nature of training that in a general way is true. It's not taking away the free will of your child. It's not taking away circumstances in life later on when you're dead and gone that they will leave the faith. It's not, it's not doing that. And yet that's kind of, we beat up ourselves sometime with that when our, our children go astray. It's not that is showing the importance when they're young, train them in the way that you go, you're helping them, that things will be with them after you're dead and gone. Do you still remember what your parents taught you? Of just manners and just things, not, not necessarily the word of God, but they stay with you because that was being taught and, and you were trained in that way. So we notice on our outline if you have that before you, we have other passages that show this discipline is uh, out of uh, love. And we won't go back over that, but Proverbs 13, 24 states that. But look at Proverbs 19 and verse 18. Because we're, the training should be done in hope. Chasten. It didn't say admonish. It says chasten. There's the discipline that's taking place. Chasten thy son. Seeing there is what? I'm not to destroy the kid. I'm not to make him feel bad and completely show who's boss. I, I have hope for him. Chasten. I have hope for her. Chasten thy son, seeing there is hope, and set not thy heart on his destruction. In that proverb, what might be destruction? That I don't chasten him they are left to themselves are going to be destroyed and that's where chastening comes that's the love i'm seeking the well-being of a child and that's that's my responsibility as a parent and so there's the there's the training is to be done in hope Ch proverbs 29 and verse 15 in your outline you can follow along with me that's why we have outlines verse 15 in verse 17 the rod and reproof what does it give See, there's the discipline, there's the corporal punishment, there's the training with the rod, there's the discipline. He said the rod and reproof. It gives what? It gives wisdom. Not knowledge. It gives how knowledge should be incorporated into my little life at this point of my life and for the future. But a child left to himself causes shame to his what? To his mother, to his, to his mother. But drop down to verse 17. Correct thy son, and he will give thee rest. Yes, he will give delight unto thy soul. 
He will be a delight to your soul, Father. Won't be ashamed to his mother. And there's a sense of the shame that comes, the feeling of that shame, because the child has not ever been disciplined. And you see as they grow up, that's, that's for their, their destruction. Look at chapter 10 and verses 1 and 5, because there's a point I want to make between these two verses. Of course, this, is the, this begins the section of the Proverbs of Solomon. The very first thing he says, a wise son maketh what kind of father? A glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. So that brings in both parents. We've seen in these passages, delight to both of them, shame to, to the mother when the, when the undisciplined child grows up and all the things that they do. But there's the glad father. And, but a foolish son is a heaviness to his mother. Now look at that verse in that same context of verse 5. He that gathereth in summer is what kind of son? He's a wise, wise son. But he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth what? Cause of shame. Oh, yeah, shame to the father, shame to the mother. So here is something. I wonder what that father, who has a wise son, I wonder what that father taught him in this context. Taught him how to work. Taught him when to work. Taught him the fruits of your labor. This is, we're gonna, you're going to be able to eat. You're going to have to go out and work in the fields. He taught him that maybe had to discipline him in that regard. But so a wise son makes a glad father, well, what in the world will be shame to a father and a mother and a shame on the boy? He that sleepeth in the harvest. You got a lazy son? Why did you allow him to be a lazy son? Training. And God left it to your own way how you're gonna do it. I think it's, it's just, it's like he leaves our modern dress, what, what is modest or not? Uh, he didn't put it in terms of robes and that sort of thing in the, in the Deuteronomy. It, it is to be always open there. And, but there is that discipline. And one of the things that you teach your children to do is to honor work. Is that a something in our society that's not necessarily praised today? Work, when I can get from the government, all those things, Work is not uh, very honorable to a lot of people as they grow up, but it is in when we teach them the ways of, of God. The family's under attack. The relationship of fathers and, and their children under attack. Government wants to take over more and more of what your child is going to hear, what they're going to learn, what they're going to read. And that's where you have to step in as a parent and realize these truths that we're, we're talking about. Any, any comments or questions on the area of Discipline. Notice this, sum it all up. It's essential in true love. If we do not admonish and we do not discipline our children, there's the corporal punishment. How we do that, we're not to do that out of anger and resentment and you embarrassed me in front of my peers and therefore you're going to get it extra when you get home. Uh, it's all about us. Oh, it's about them, their future, their ho hope we have for them. If, as mature parents, we have to bring ourselves into that realm of thinking. And that's what God is teaching us. Anything you'd like to add to that? Yes, Rick. That's right, and the discipline is helping them to train themselves in it. It's kind of, here are the, here are the barriers. So with, with that, that thought of mind, let's just look at what we're talking about when we talk about obedience in other relationships. Richard is bringing that up. What about the relationship with the government? Will that be something they've learned, obedience? Remember, that was the imperative, children obey. 
Well, obey their parents. But what is this going to be essential? It's going to be essential for other important relationships of authority. And there's where the government comes into play. In Romans, the 13th chapter, in verse 1, we see, and your child is going to grow up, and they're going to read this, and, and you're going to, you've been disciplining them in the area of obedience for a long time. Well, they may read real early these days, but you've been doing it for a while before they could read. But in Romans 13 and verse 1, let every soul, that means everybody, be in subjection to the higher powers. Why? There's no power but God. And here is where he brings in, this is where I have set government. Didn't say it's what kind of government, kings, a social republic, or whatever you have, or a democratic republic, whatever form. He's looking at the principle of government. And wherever that soul is, whatever time frame that will be, whatever country they are in, this is good teaching. This will be something they need to be trained in. There's no power of God and the powers that are ordained of God. His ordained governmental powers. So we honor the king. We pay our taxes in this context. And what is the context of this government that's functioning as God would have it? They're punishing evil. They're praising good. Sometimes governments get that out of whack. And we have to live with that. As God's people, we know what government's for, and if we have an ch uh, opportunity to change that, then we will be able to do that through, through our voting. But government has this place in which that young person is going to have to learn that, uh, that relationship. Now, what has happened because of racism, if you want to call it that, over the, the years, what has been having to be taught to people maybe a minority and their, their color is not what the policemen are usually in that color and, and, and we have problems with that so to speak. Let's say if we do. What are they being taught? What are parents having to teach their children who may have the skin color of brown or black? What do you teach them? You better honor the policeman. If these things are out there you better be very careful that you do that instead of back talking, instead of anybody back talking, instead of refusing to re, uh, honor the, the rules. I don't care what color you are, but especially if you're being persecuted, I'm not saying people are, if that's happening, a Christian can live with that because I see this and son, you're gonna have to be real careful when you're stopped by a policeman. And I think everybody has to be careful because policemen are being, are being shot and killed. And respecting authority is gonna be, help. you may not live very long if you don't. And then we can get down, whose fault is it? Well, if children are saying, you, you just back talk anybody, you're, 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 you're somebody special, then we haven't done them a good service because government has a power to bring down the iron fist, whether you like it or not. God has ordained government to protect and promote the good and to bring down the sword, capital punishment, upon the evil. That's what government is there for. But what about the relationship of the church? Elders. Elders are not infallible. Elders have no right to rule apart from the word of God, but they have to make judgments based upon that word. And in a congregation, we see those elders are making decisions for the benefit of our souls. And he says, obey them that have rule over you. We're not talking about kings and queens and presidents and Congress. We're talking about elders in a local church. Obey them that have rule over you and submit to them. Why? Are they watch? In behalf of you, so just like government has its proper place, God's letting that be known. Here's the proper place. They watch on behalf of your souls. They're not lording it over your souls. They're guiding you in the word of God that they first are also following. And you do that on, because they watch on behalf of your souls because they're going to have to give an account 
and you may and that that they may do this with joy and not with grief for this were unprofitable to you you didn't benefit from their guidance and we often hear people may we be a easy sheep to flock easy sheep to lead we're a flock where'd you get that may we be an easy sheep to guide and lead I think a lot of it came, I want them to have an easy road here. I want them to have joy. I want to be submitting to them and not causing issues and trouble because I appreciate what they're there for by God. I want that to be a joyous occasion. I think that comes into people's hearts and prayer, but it's right here in the Word of God. And you can say this. May their leadership be profitable and may they do it with joy and not grief. We can say that prayer. Well, easy be, be an easy sheep. What did it say? Guide or lead? Shepherd. Huh? Shepherd. Shepherd. Okay. I'm trying to do different words. That's probably a problem. So be easy. And that, that's, that's good. We want that. That's, that's Bible. That's scriptural. But there's submission. There's obedience. That's there. Where did they first learn that? in the home, with parents. What about marriage? We've seen that the wife is to submit to her husband, Colossians 3.18, because this is fitting. This fits very well with the Lord. So it's not out of kelter. It's not, well, this is something new, and, and uh, we're just going against God, and, and we're just trying to be oppressive in our modern age, and all of that. No, that's befitting in the Lord. So wonder if you have a daughter What will you be teaching her? I've dealt with people that are going to get married, and sometimes the woman's afraid. And I go back to 1 Peter 3, and I said, don't you fear. And a lot of times they're thinking about marrying one who's not a Christian. Not wise, but in 1 Peter 3, are they uh, Christians or not Christians, those husbands, in chapter 3 and verse 1? That a woman who is a child of God is married to. She may find herself in that. I, I go there. Even if that's the case, you don't fear their fear. You're a servant of the Lord, and you do what? You submit to them. As long as they don't contradict the Word of God. You've got to have that issue a lot with... Uh, non-Christians but there is a daughter that one day you hope will have a husband and there's that submission that is there Now we've talked there is a sense of submission of a of a godly man who's going to be a husband because they're looking to the well-being of their wife I understand that but that's not this submission well everybody submits to one another and it, we're no this is special this is the arrangement of the husband-wife, wife-husband relationship. He's head, she submits. Where is she going to get that teaching? And more than once, I've had bridesmaids of weddings I did, of members, and they say, you will never preach my funeral because you said you must obey your husband. The Bible says do that. I ain't backing down because they don't understand the relationship to God. They're just, they just attend a funeral, they're, I mean a funeral wedding, and they're, uh, some of them not even Christians. And they are appalled at that. They just need to be taught. Well, what are you gonna do with a daughter if you're gonna raise them to be godly, the way they should go? I think that may be submission in that relationship as well. Very special with a with a wife, with a husband. You're preparing them in hope for their, their joyous life as well. Anything you'd like to add to that before we move on? It's very important in obedience, not only with uh, parents, but you're preparing them for government, for church, for marriage. Yes, sir. David?
just did a commentary this week on Luke 2. Did Jesus submit to his parents? And, yet, and they didn't know as much as he did. Which is amazing to me. They didn't know what it meant to be about my father's, in my father's house, is what the text really says. In my father's house. They've been, where have they been searching for him? Everywhere. They said, well, said, you know, I must be in my father's house. This is where you ought to go. But they didn't understand that. She, she didn't. They, they thought about it in their hearts. But did Jesus say, well, I know more than you do, mom and dad. I think I'll stay here in my father's house and y'all go back home. He went back and submitted to them. And the next thing we learn in Luke is that he's 30 years of age, ready to do his, start his ministry. So was he inferior to his parents? No. And, if that does, and that's a great point. It's not inferiority, but that's how the world looks at it. If we submit, you have just cowed down. You're inferior. And, and they just have to be taught. And that type of person will probably never submit to God. <laughs> there's, that, there's that problem there. So that's a good point. All right? Let's look at establishing godly values. We got the imperatives, but what happens along the way? We're teaching them obedience that'll help in relationships, but we're also establishing godly values, such as the idea of honor. See, we honor our father. Where do we get this idea of honor? Well, that's an imperative. And we see that honor your father and mother is used in scripture that when they're old and they, they can't help themselves, that's where you step in. You require your parents and grandparents. As Timothy tells us. But if you honor something, you have to place value. We talk about our country's values, whatever that is at a particular time. But there's the value that we fix upon things of honoring. So I'd like to honor goodness and truth. From Ephesians 5, 9 and 10, he tells us something that uh, it seems like they don't go together, the fruit of light. I think the fruit of a tree. But what is the fruit of light? He tells you, but you once were in darkness, but now light. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. God's truth is right. I put those things together. It's the foundation is truth because it reveals what is right with God. What's right is true. What's true is right. But there's also goodness. And I thought, what wonderful two values. If I were starting all over again, that, that I want to make sure the values they honor. I, I, we got them there. We got them looking at heroes of the Bible when they're young. Hebrews 11. But godly values, something that is good. It's beautiful in its being. Just look at it. That's beautiful. And it's beneficial in its effect. That covers all spectrums of the word good in the New Testament. Two different words, but they all bring together. What is beautiful in its being. God created everything and saw that it was what? Good. Had not necessarily functioned yet. Beauty in its being. But it's beneficial in its effect. Don't repay evil for evil, but do that which repay with good, that which is beneficial to the person. So when you put all that together, put it in one there, there's this goodness. And for you to create in your child value, that, that's good. You want to take them to an art museum and see beautiful paintings and that's that, that's good. It, it conveys a good thought. It, it, it's beautiful strokes. It's just quality. It's good. But there's things that are beneficial in, a, in effect that are just out there. And especially in, in God's word, we're to be involved with, with doing that which is good and not evil. And then the truth is there. Our, our young people are bombarded and you see it, you see it in, our, in our government today, of people being raised as postmodern. They can twist things and make something sound like that's the truth. 
That's the truth. This is my truth. I'm a man and I want to be called a woman. You better address me as a woman because the laws may come down on you. Can you imagine a policeman? Uh, sir, here's your driver's license. I do not want to be referred to you, but, 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 sir. I am a she. And he doesn't do that. There could be a time when government says, you need to go time out for you, Mr. Policeman. You need to go get some training. Because whatever I claim to be, I'll be that. That's a, that's a life, we, that's where we live in. I want to be a different race. I'm declaring it. And you better honor it. See, honor, you better honor that. And people have completely disassociated themselves from biological truth. <laughs> that's their fantasy world. But you're going to have to live in it, and if powers be, you're going to have to submit to it. If you, unless you're going to stand for God. And you're going to have to find a way to do that. Without getting yourself put in jail, I guess. Some teaching is going to have to be done in a very uh, wise way. But that's the world we live in. And can you imagine? I never had to grow up wondering, does he want to be a she or a he? And what if I use the wrong pronoun if I'm a teacher in school? All of the things that are just crazy. And so, but they have to be anchored in truth. And what is a wonderful thing about that? Biological truth is never going to change. It's just, and it surprises me that the women's movement have allowed men, transgender, to take over the athletics uh, in, in, their, in their colleges and universities and set all sorts of uh, new records for women. And women can compete in women's sports. It'd be victorious. Why has it that been overturned? Because they don't want it to be. But the reality of biological differences are that that will not change. That's absolute truth. But we're not going to live in that society. Our young people are not going to be living there they, in the sense of they're bombarded that this is the way we're going to live. And we're going to silence any other voices that disagree. That's the world they live in. Truth is very important, parents, to be teaching. It's absolute truth. And we go to God's word to do that. So that's, that's going to be a strong component of character. And then glorifying God is the ultimate purpose in life. It's not glorifying me. It's not my life needs to be easy. But it's always glorifying God. And to get one passage, 2 Thessalonians 1, 11 and 12. Think about this passage. To which end we also pray always for you. This is on Paul's mind. He prayed for the Thessalonians. That our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of goodness. So here's something that's good. Every desire of goodness, I want it to be fulfilled. And every work of faith. So here's your desire to do good. Here's your desire to be faithful based upon what's right and what's true. Every work of faith, don't with power. That, in the, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and we in him. What? A comprehensive passage. God's glorified in these type of people and what we're doing and goodness and our work of faith is to glorify him. It's not us. It's to glorify him. He's going to be glorified in us. Put that in your plans. Everything we do, we're going to do it for the glory of God. And you've got other passages that, that will state that. Whatever you do, eat or drink, do all of the glory of God. If we get that in their minds, then they're ready. Well, God's truth glorifies him, and therefore I will stand for truth. I will do good works that indeed are authorized by him. Godly values, I think, needs to be established today. All right? Doing good works. We'll just briefly go through that. But Hebrews 13, 17 is doing that which is good, but I want you to notice in Romans the second chapter in verse 7 that it should be something that is a constant focus in our lives. We're preparing our children to be godly. And here's the thing. We'll, let's just fast forward to the judgment. We're all going to be there. But it says, to them that by patience and well-doing, doing good, there's that good works, well-doing, that by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and incorruption. So we're sick, we're, because 
Jesus' glorified body, we're going to look forward to that glorified state as well. And honor and incorruption. What we have in store for us is the eternal life. That's got to be continuing all the way to the judgment. And what a way to train early that indeed we're going to be a family. We're going to be engaged. We're going to be engaged in good works that, that gives God the glory. And it'll be a constant in our, in our lives. And then finally in this outline of lesson four, the conscience. That's part of your, your child's makeup. And that's part of a human being. Now it can be hardened and can become ineffective and in a sense but it always is going to govern on the basis of what they know to be right what they know to be right who's there teaching them what's right Where, who's supposed to be doing that that's you and me as parents so you do that because that's the way they should go and you do that doesn't mean takes away their free will all of that sort of thing but having a good conscience living where you're not doubting what you did is be right. You thought through it before you did anything that had a doubt in it. And if you doubted it, you didn't do it. But you lived according to what you know to be right. What a wonderful way to live. And it becomes very important, especially when they're, they're young. It was, it's, again, a constant imperative. Paul lived with all good conscience. He did things wrong. But he did it with a good conscience because he thought he was doing the will of God by killing these uh, upstarts named Christians. And, but he didn't violate his conscience. And that's what made him an, a, a very powerful man in serving God. He, he learned the truth. And he would not go against that conscience of will, even, even die for it. But what about the idea of it prepares us for life's critical moments. You're not there with your child when all of a sudden they have to make a moral decision. Their peers want them to do one thing. They know God says do another. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, young men, they found themselves in that situation. They didn't bow their knees when all of their peers did, when their peers did, and Babylonian captivity. And then they had another chance. He went, devil's not gonna let you off the hook. They're gonna put that, he's gonna put that in front of you again and just uh, heat up the fire a little bit to kind of, you know, this is certain death. But what were they, what? The truth is, will not serve other gods. They knew that truth, it wasn't gonna change just because the situation changed. And they withstood that. Well, they didn't violate your conscience. And their situation ended well. <laughs> the idea of, of, of being saved from death. John the Baptist ended with his head being severed because he refused to back off the truth of God. And God's involved with both of them. But we should never violate our, our conscience. And I think Daniel is a wonderful, you want to get those heroes for them, that what you're teaching is a conscience that needs to be intact all through their life. And it is it's imperative that they, uh, that they do that. Any, any questions on, on that? We put the imperatives of children that they're to obey, to honor, and all those things. Uh, we looked at the discipline area where fathers are to take uh, part of, of training, which involves that discipline. And so what God does is that he leaves those things to us. And the point is, is that we need to develop. I've given you guidelines. You can trash it. You know, it may not mean anything to you. It means a lot to me. I think it would be very helpful. That's what it's designed for. But I just conclude, your children, is go they're going to grow bodily. Their body is going to mature. Now, you can... Support that with good nutrition, but they're going to grow. The important thing is that will they grow in their, their spiritual mind as well? And that's where we have to, to come in. And, and if we take, those, we take those broad principles and guidelines and, and things that are connected with obedience, things that are connected with 
honor and values, and you put that in your own plan, do it. But plan, because they're going to grow up on us, and we have to say, well, what are we going to do? And your, your wife and husband need to be together. We talk about the, the reading of the Bible and all those types of things, learning how to pray, and all those things will be in the home. Uh, fathers are taking that lead. But we do it within the framework of God's word. And I think we'll do what God would have us to do. Everybody, even that child, is going to have a, a free will. But if we just took care of them physically, monetarily, and those things. If we didn't do that, 1 Timothy 5, 8 says we're worse than an unbeliever if we don't provide for our family. But the area that we have to step in, especially it's critical, it always has been, but especially when the family and, and the church and uh, things are, the institutions that we took for granted, schools and that sort of thing, they're being changed. And the hearts of children are gonna to have to be, to be strengthened. And uh, we as parents have to provide for their physical needs, but oh, very important for their spiritual needs. Any, any questions or comments you'd like to add to that? Sure. Yes, sir? Good point, yeah. To understand that, that it's done in love and kindness, that sometimes I don't want to be the one that administers the discipline, but it's a result of your actions. But that regular exercising of logic, and this is the result of what you've done, helps to build that conscience. It's not just in discipline, but to allow them to critically understand what they're doing, why they're doing it. The hardest thing as a parent is to be consistent. Yeah, to show that there's a consequence when you do violate your conscience is very helpful. That's part of the training. That's when good. They're young, you are their God. They yeah. Understand fully what God is. You are their God. And when they understand that, you're administering discipline because they misbehave, not because of your opinion, but that's your role. And yeah. when they understand that as they get older, it helps them shape, understand that my mom or dad now is now I'm responsible to God, not just my Good point. Would you agree that our responsibility as parents cease when they leave the home, but our responsibility as a fellow Christian assumes and continues because we treat them then as any other Christian in their exhortation and edification? Yeah. I think even the Word of God, when, when does it, when does that young man grow up and now he has his own family that we look at? For him to be an elder, it's it's there comes a time when they've that relationship of father and mother has changed. He's got his own household, not just well he's still in my house and that sort of thing. It, there's there comes a time when they have their own families. So that point about it ceases when they leave the home or when they establish their own home. But you're always there to you're always there to give them comfort. That's and, and direction if they need that. But that's true. It's it's. Uh, at least there, but as a Christian, we have that responsibility continually, don't we? It's a good point. Any other thoughts? Well, I thought we'd get into this, but I'll just uh, save it for next time. We, lesson five, and uh, it's a little bit different. We usually have, I have things and it's just blanks. No questions other than fill in the blanks. And, but if you'll follow with me and these charts, I think you'll be able to write those in yourself. And so if you'll follow that with me in our, our lesson number five, we'll try to get into that uh, next time. Thank you.